heard from politicians and the public is it's time for change. Time to throw off the apron strings of our past, our past history, our past you know, connection with um, the motherland, and have something that's to do with our own identity. Why is it so important to have our own flag? Hamish. Thank you. <clears throat> well, actually, I, I don't agree with some of those sentiments because I think they're actually just a kind of knee-jerk reaction. I think you either get the Canadian version of somebody saying this is what it's going to be, or you think it through rather carefully. And I think that the discussion we're not having is why we have a flag in the first place and what flags we have. I mean, it may surprise you to know, would somebody like to guess how many flags have officially flown in New Zealand since um, Tasman came here in 1762? Just roughly, how many? 10? 15? It's actually 1,500. <laughs> so we have a big flag history to digest. And one of the first things I'd like to see happen is to digest it, to get to come to terms with the flags we have or have had and get some notion of what our ancestors thought flags, their flags were about. There are, for instance, 100 Te Koti flags in Te Papa, none of which have ever been exhibited. That's 100 flags for one particular movement. Now, some of those flags are actually quite startling pieces of design, but we have no idea if we flew one where it came from. And Dick, what do you think about this? Um, why have a flag? I'll, 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 I'll have a go without that, actually. But... Dick, we need that for the recording with the film. Oh, the, I, no, can I, I don't want it. No, no, we need it for the <laughs> filming. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Trouble uh, maker. Well, I... I like that. As usual, to, uh, approach it much more sort of um, literally and simply than that. I, I, I don't agree with Hamish. I think that's overthinking it. I think that's just clouding the water. I think that we could go to it and come up with a flag. I mean, it's just a flag at the end of the day, you know what I mean? It's not the history of New Zealand or anything. I, the, 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 what worries me is that everyone feels this is the once in a lifetime opportunity, so we have to somehow sum everything up with this flag, but, you know, when there's one flag over there that's three, three different stripes, and I think you could, you know, the, you could probably just do that like everyone else does. You don't, you don't I'm, I'm just worried that every time people, it's very emotional, they go to it emotionally, and everyone, when they want it, they think Koru, or Kiwi, and everyone, you know, the obvious pair of jandals, I don't know what, <laughs> but the, uh, and I just, and you can see with my design what I've done, I've just gone for continuity, I've, I've de by the way, I want to say straight away, and there might be people here, here who know this, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the originator of the, uh, my design was a gentleman called Clark Titman, who used to be a bit of a person, he was an American, he used to be a bit of a personality in New Zealand and cultural, sort of pop cultural circles back in the 70s. And he, I know his, some of his family is still around, they get a bit shirty when I keep going on about this design. He, Clark, came up with a Union Jack in, a, in the navy blue, moved it to the central, and he had two red bars going, and I just used it up a bit with the, with the white just to bring in that. It's interesting that the, um, our flag up there. See the see the bar, the bar down the middle of the Union Jack. I've got it just taken that, and so I've got this. And so to me, it doesn't have to be m any more complicated than that conceptually. That's what I'm saying. Um, I, but I do think it's important that we have one. I mean, you've obviously, as uh, you know, deeply involved in the listener, you've read and seen so much. Why do you think we need a flag? What What are people saying is the need for a flag? Right. Okay. Well, I think, uh, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, asking me along today. When journalists get together these days, we first have to hold hands and chant, I'm a journalist and I'm a worthwhile human being. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nothing compared to the contentious field of flag design. Um, but when you look around and see these bold and beautiful designs, I really do think it's great to have this level of public engagement and to see you all here. Now, obviously, a flag is just one expression of our cultural identity. 
But I do think that there's kind of a mood and a momentum for change, and you see it in the way that the, um, the national anthem is now sung in Māori, and nobody decreed it, we just started doing it, and the same way that the, um, the silver fern is used in sporting occasions. Um, I think New Zealanders are, are ready for, for um, you know, a, a bolder assertion of our national identity. Um, I think we need it in um, pragmatic terms, and um, trade and tourism, and uh, for sporting, and cultural events, we, we need something that's distinctively New Zealand. I mean, uh, when you see the Canadian flag, you think Canada immediately. Um, the, the Stars and Stripes, you think America, the Union Jack, you think the UK. We need something that, that's not just an anachronistic expression of imperialism, which the Union Jack is. I think that um, we're a fresh, young, confident nation, um, bicultural, increasingly multicultural, and uh, we need a flag that represents that. And I think also um, there's the emotional element that, that doesn't get talked about very often. I felt it when um, I walked the Milford Track in January this year. And it is an amazing thing, the best walk in the world, and you should do it before they turn it into a dairy conversion. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. It's primordial rainforest. It's you know alpine pegs. You can drink the water. You can in the rivers. You can almost drink the water from the from the gutter alongside the track. And um, I remember <coughs> going into the second hut, the second day of Pamplona Hut. And um, it was cold, that it had been snowing. And you go into the, um, to the uh, hut, and there's a, a, a large group of people, um, Americans, Japanese, you know, from all nationalities. You go in there, and you see the New Zealand flag on the wall, and you, it's almost involuntary. You know, you stand a little taller, you, you feel a surge of pride. And then you hear an Australian voice behind that says, "Here's our flag." Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, "No, no." But the interesting thing was that you were New Zealand said, and um, because the Australians said it was their flag, and Americans asserted it was the Australian flag. And um, and you look at it, you think, um, does our flag have um, four stars? Or um, you know, when actually we weren't sure of our own flag and our own country. And we asked the others coming in, um, you know, Americans, uh, uh, the British, um, they all thought it was the Australian flag. So can we please have a flag that we don't feel embarrassed and ambivalent about in our own country? Um, and I do understand the emotion that goes with it, um, you know, the sacrifice and the struggle that re that flag represents of people who, who fought um, in theatres of war. And, um, you know, I had two friends, great uncles who went to World War One, who were, um, one came back paralysed, the other so shell-shocked TP, couldn't marry, couldn't work. Um, my father served in World War II, he was a fighter pilot, a uh, decorated fighter pilot, he was shot down off the coast of Japan, he was lucky beyond words to be rescued by a submarine, so I, I do understand the need to honour all that that, stand, that that flag represents, but, but I do think this is the time to have this public discussion. What is the issue behind this emotion? Why is the flag such an emotionally charged thing? Why is it potentially so divisive in terms of well, what we choose? I suppose originally, with the day in the medieval days of the knights and lords uh, getting their um, troops uh, to go into battle and get themselves slaughtered on his behalf. Uh, that was the emotion they were trying to, to engender, that kind of loyalty, that uh, something to die for, you know, which is not, a, not a, an emotion that I would like to um, engender, but that's traditionally how flags have evolved, uh, also territorial, you know, we're here, plant the flag, it's ours, you know, um, <clears throat> the top of Everest or the, or the shores of uh, Aotearoa. Um, <clears throat> So, um, but then I think uh, Dick summed it up quite well in the discussion we had yesterday for Radio New Zealand that actually it's what looks um, good around uh, when Valerie Adams is uh, running up the track uh, after winning her latest gold medal, you know. <laughs> so it's just a feel good uh, thing, that's all the flag is when you look at it. <clears throat> well, the, back in the, I, I think I probably first started thinking about this in 1984 when the Export Institute, it was export year and Muldoon era um, just before he got perfed out and um, <clears throat> the, um, it, it, they put together a very good video in the early days of videos called A Clash of Symbols that showed that New Zealand was going out into the world representing itself with a little map with Kiwis, with the Southern Cross, with the Silver Fern, uh, with the Koru on the tail of the 
uh, nearly in New Zealand aeroplanes and they said, we're such a petty little country in this vast world. Why are we confusing everybody with all these different symbols? We need one simple solution to it. Out of that came the Miha, which uh, got done, done over very quickly by the great New Zealand clobbering machine. And uh, people, politicians have been very scared to put their toe in the water since then. But, uh, <clears throat> but that was, as Pamela said, the pragmatic reason for just being visible uh, in the global landscape, in the crowded landscape. Uh, and when we are visible, when we do stand out, we get a lot of pride from that. So I think it's a, the positive pride that we get. So Hamish, do you think as we look to the future and try to decide on what sort of flag we're going to have, it's going to be a motive issue, or is it just going to be something we easily cruise through and, yeah, that'll do, that'll work? Well, I, I haven't got an answer to that because it could be both. But listening to what other people are saying uh, just adds to the fact there's an enormous amount of confusion about the New Zealand flag. The first New Zealand flag we adopted, and uh, we adopted, New Zealanders adopted it, it wasn't foist on us, it was 1835, and that's a version of this flag here which I fly from my house, just to, to remind ourselves that we actually have some image of ourselves going back further than 1902. Oh, but what's the background on that flag, just very simply, quickly, Hamish, well, that one there? Kind of, it's sometimes called the, uh, the flag of the United Tribes. Um, it was recognised by Queen Victoria's uncle, or grandfather, William III, I think, as the flag of the independent sovereign nation of New Zealand. Um, we, now, the reason why we have it is an Australian connection, because the Australians had taken to seizing New Zealand built ships when they sailed into Sydney Harbour on the grounds they had no flag. I don't know if you know that, uh, is that lovely comedian, is he, um, is that? Who, um, <laughs> yeah, he doesn't think, you've got no flag, right, here's your flag and you're ours. I mean, that notion of um, not having a flag, you, you don't own where you are or what you are, and uh, the Australians were seizing New Zealand ships. The New Zealand uh, chiefs in the north got together, I think 25 of them, and selected a flag so that we could be an independent sovereign state, which the British recognised us as. Now, when people say, well, the flag doesn't matter, it's just a bit of adornment. It does matter, but it matters in both deep and shallow ways. Um, Anybody who doesn't think flags matter should go and spend some time, as I did, during the marching season last year in Northern Ireland in Belfast, mm -hmm. where whether one street would kill the neighbours and another street was all about flags. The streets without flags were the, uh, the um, Republicans and the, the, um, the Republicans and the Nationalists, and the streets with flags were the Loyalists and the Unionists. If you work out the difference between those, it's quite difficult. But they were bloody differences and remained that way. They remained that way for hundreds of years. So I kind of think flags do matter because they are symbols of difference. So I think if we are going to have a new flag, and I believe we should, I believe it's more than time that we dispossessed ourselves of the flag that was foist on us, um, because we didn't have a flag when we had some royal visitors in, in 1901. We had to make a flag up, and we made flags up. That, uh, that first flag was uh, done, uh, facilitated by Mr. Busby, and as I read the history, um, they were given uh, a limited number of choices, and they got a bit worn out, finally got uh, uh, made a choice, and for their troubles, the chiefs were given, uh, allowed to share a fat of cold porridge, while uh, Mr. Busby went off and celebrated his great breakthrough. <laughs> in a slightly more luxurious way. We clearly have different histories. <laughs> but the, uh, I mean, we, we ignore our history at our peril, and associated with that flag was the New Zealand Declaration of Independence uh, drafted for and signed by those chiefs. So in fact, it was a little more than just doing it for some cold porridge. Um, I think in the Bible somebody gives away something from a mess of pottage. Yes, right. <laughs> so in the background have confused that story. Thank you, Hamish. So are there any particular rules that should be going alongside of making statements through flags about difference? I mean, there may be a few rules in the past, but what are the rules, as you see it, as we look forward today in well, terms the, of flag design? 
It's an interesting point. I mean, there, there, there's just, just still the same old rules. I mean, nothing's changed. We haven't suddenly, I mean, you get a lot of people saying, oh, we, maybe we don't need a flag. Haven't we evolved beyond, you know, all that sort of flag waving kind of bullshit? But in actual fact, we haven't. I mean, the idea that we've suddenly evolved into some different species that don't have these emotions is just is fanciful. So we, I think you, you, you totally have to buy into the whole flag argument. I mean, there's no, it's a red herring to bring anything else up, uh, you know, that people are going to respond to this flag. Interestingly enough, seeing it on the wall here and have, seeing it every day when I go up Franklin Road, you know, I could just about buy that now, kind of uh, sort of thinking more about it. It's, it's, there's a why, certain... Why could you buy it now, Dick? Uh, well, before I used to think it was still too much like uh, sort of <laughs> historical, too, you know, I don't know, like an old... Um, Gully painting or something, you know, with a varnish wooden frame, too much like an antique or something. Right. But um, that wouldn't look bad wrapped right around Valerie Adams' shoulders, would it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the English flag. With the, uh, the I mean, it's got all the elements in it, funnily enough, <laughs> that we're talking about. It's, um, you know, the, it, I'm, and I can see it over there in the, in the, on the poster on the door there. It, it would be, um, it would, it would solve a lot of arguments. I mean, it could, it, we could, it could cut to the chase in a funny kind of way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Love you. So, Pamela, for you, right. as we look to the future, what would you consider are the key elements that need to inform a flag design? Well, I think um, in, in terms of flying up true colours, we have to get the colours right. Um, uh, I think most flags around the world are red, white and blue, some element to that. Um, I know, um, it, uh, for example, the Samoan flag, that um, I was born in Samoa, so I'm, I'm familiar with, with that too, and that the, um, the blue symbolises the freedom, the red symbolises courage, and as I understand, um, red is very important in Māori um, and the white symbolises purity of purpose, and that flag <laughs> incorporates it all. Um, I used to think the silver fern was, um, would be good to have in a flag. Now I'm not quite so sure because of the association with sporting um, achievements. Not that I'm against sport. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and the core is quite commercial in, in some ways. I think the, um, um, the, the, um, you know, the stars are, are quite important in a way. They're on the Samoan flag and the Australian flag. We are part of Oceana. Mm. Uh, I think it's important to proudly say that we belong in this corner of the world and then we're very confident about that. Um, as for the, the other elements, um, I like, you know, there's a lot of flags. Um, I love the Tena Rangatira uh, Tanga flag. Um, I think it's fantastic that we can now fly that on, on state occasions alongside the New Zealand flag. And I think that would happen with whatever new flag, if there was a new flag decided on it, could fly alongside the current, the existing flag, as, they, as it happened in Canada when they um, first um, filled the new flag. Um, as for, for other elements, I think it's for New Zealanders to decide, and I, I really look forward to the uh, debate. Uh, might be we could ask everyone here, and perhaps we'd have a thousand different ideas. How are we going to sort this one out? Yeah, well, uh, no, the way that I've been thinking about it is not to just think of a flag, but to think of an identity system, which sounds very commercial and graphic designers and branding and all of that stuff, which is, sounds... Uh, far too commercial to be uh, applied to a cultural thing like that. But what I mean by that is um, the, the ones that have worked successfully uh, have elements like the stars and stripes. You can do all sorts of things with stars and stripes that are immediately recognisable as relating to the United States without it being the flag form. Um, personally, I think there are and quite enough flags in the world with stars and stripes of one sort or another, and quite enough with red, white and blue. New Zealand needs to distinguish itself by being different, by being courageously, refreshingly different. And uh, <clears throat> we seem to have uh, adopted black and white as, um, or black and silver as our uh, colours in many levels. So why not uh, be the one that stands out? I mean, I, I uh, was looking at the Commonwealth Games um, and then looking at other <clears throat> groupings of international flags. I thought, wow, black and white would stand out so well in that. And let's just 
distinguish ourselves by being different, not by being the same. So what do you think about that idea? Man? It's being distinctively different. Don't follow the mob out there with all the colours, designs and the main elements they use. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I, I agree with that, but it's, uh, a difference doesn't have to be vast. A difference can be subtle. I mean, just thinking of black and white as colours for flags, I know of two, uh, nationally, uh, or three black and white flags, the Jolly Roger, um, uh, the current Al Qaeda flag, <laughs> and the flag of the Duke of Wales. <laughs> but just uh, what elements should be in a flag? Colour is definitely one of them. Interesting enough, Pamela was talking about what those elements that she recognised as important in the flag, which was almost a mirror of the discussion those chiefs had at um, Waitangi back in 1835. And uh, their argument about the red was they needed that for the blood of Papatu and Nuku and the blue for Rangi and the stars, and the white for, for clarity, I think. But, I mean, there's all sorts of things. Uh, I did, don't know if it's true or not, but I read somewhere that the Dutch had a long discussion about how their tree colour would work, and they had it vertically because it, however much wore off the flag, it would still be a Dutch flag. <laughs> <laughs> Just coming back to the silver fern that Pamela mentioned a moment ago, that has been almost like our signature of recognition, whether it's on America's Cups or on the, you know, boats or on, you know, John Key, what he talks about or whatever else. And you look around the artwork here, I think there's only one here that has the silver fern on it. Yeah, what? it's, it's, uh, it's two now. Yeah. Yeah. Two now, okay, there's two here. That's new a, edition, new edition. New edition, okay. Yeah. So I've, what do you I've, think I've been, I've been working on this flag thing now for, 20 years or whatever, and it's and the and I every now and again I think oh God I'll just cave in and go with the fern you know what I mean and you get the fern out you spend days you put it here you put it there you put it right across you do it up and down and you diddly diddly down and it just does not work on a flag you know and you might can make this bloody thing work on a flag that I'll take my hat up and I say you can you know I'll wave it but I, I bet I never see it it just it works on as a brand, as a fern, you know, you can put it on anything, but on a flag, nah, doesn't work, you know. And all the other biomorphic things don't work. That Pontevasa snail it drives me nuts. That's not a flag, you know. It, 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 all, the, all the vegetable, all the vegetables and the organics and the, and the ferns and the corals and the whatever else, they just don't cut it, you know. The thing about the Canadian flag that is so successful is that the, the, the maple it's leaf organic. is no, but it's not. It is organic, but it comes across. It could could be a star. It is so you know. It could. It, it is such a symmetrical image that it tra that it goes beyond the organic and has become the sort of totally tough. There's something. It has to be sort of crisp and spiky somehow to work on a flag, or maybe it's the contrast, I'm just making this up now. But, you know, <laughs> maybe it's the fact, the fact that, the, you know, the flag itself is organic, the way it flaps, yeah. and, the, and, the, and then it has to be a geometric thing on the flag, because you yeah. put the organic shape on a fluttery flag, it's just, it's just one great big wavy mess. So Hamish, what are you going to talk about making up now? Well, well uh, sorry, just make, you know, I just wanted to add a bit to what Dick was saying, because flags have to be seen as moving objects, not flats of paper. And that's why I think the, the, um, a lot of the flag designs go wrong, because they're not conceived as something which is constantly changing its shape. Right. Uh, Michael says, I think that's one flag that, that actually does that. But right, uh, the snail drives me mad, and so does the white feather. It doesn't work as well. Once that's a moving collection of very simple things, which remember that has to be in the eye, unraveled as a moving object and made into a, a symbol of something. I think that, that's a fundamental of flag design that a lot of people miss, miss the point of. Mm -hmm. Right, Pamela, what about the coin? I, I like the symbolism, you know, the, the um, unfolding national identity, yep. the new nation. I, I do like that. I, I agree. I don't like green. That's the colour of my old school uniform, so please don't choose that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, but this... Put some colours. always take it off. But, but there's, you know, there's nothing to stop us changing. I think there's 19 countries that have changed their flag this century. And, and we do need no, to change. This, I think there's 30 
um, you know, Caribbean or Oceanic countries that are very similar to our flag, I'm, I really do think it's, it's time to change. And I think even with very divisive things, change can happen quickly. If you look at the gay marriage debate, it would have been unthinkable, really. It was so divisive. And now it's just, um, we just accept it. We, we move on. Great. And celebrate it. Uh, Michael, you had something you wanted to say about the uh, quarter. Uh, uh, well, probably I should just do a promo for next week's uh, talk, two o'clock next week. I'm going to give a talk called Raising the Branding Standard, um, which... Whereabouts, Michael? Mm -hmm. here. Whereabouts? Here at 2 o'clock next, at two next o Sunday. Next Saturday. <laughs> Saturday, next Saturday, yeah. right. 13th, uh, but uh, in the, there I will expose the long-running plot of bureaucrats to foist the fern upon us and been subtly uh, insinuated into everything. We even had um, <clears throat> Catherine, uh, Duchess of Cambridge, uh, doing her bit for it when she was here, not to mention the portrait of the Queen with that little fern brooch. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a very definite campaign. John Key is simply the front man for what the uh, bureaucrats have been trying to organise for a long time. And I, like uh, Dick, just don't think it works. Uh, it, 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 apart from the, uh, the white feather. Oh, of course, the answer to the, to the white feather thing is, is to say, which John Key did say, um, ah, but it's not the flag that, uh, <clears throat> that are on the graves of our um, boys buried in the Western Front on the cross, embedded in the cross, or engraved in the cross of this, is the fern. Um, so that's why I think 1917 is the year that we're going to be uh, discussing that, because we'll be, you know, it'll be 100 years since Passchendaele and the song and all of that, and we'll get, until you talk about emotion, uh, they will uh, build that emotion. So but a lot of what I've been doing is to try and fend off the fern. <laughs> now, is there a question out there that someone would like to ask? Rodney. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And to the panel, um, I wonder whether, as a New, New Zealand nation of people, we should be looking at our own knowledge of this country, the things that we know about, we see around us, and our history, something we know most of our history. Should we be looking at that as more important in the new flag or should it be that we look at a flag that is more recognisable by the rest of the world as being distinctively New Zealand? Hamish. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to duck and dive and give you John Key answer on that one. Both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 we definitely need something that is about us now, but it also has to be about how we got here. And I think there's some very simple elements and they don't add up to can I just make a point for a moment? The, the fern. The fern is not actually embellished on graves in Europe uh, as a white thing on a black background. That, that's actually a cunning bit of language. And in fact, on that matter, New Zealanders in World War I never, in any record that I know of, fought under a New Zealand flag. And they only very seldom fought under New Zealand flags in World War II. Now, we were always subservient to the, the Union Jack. In some of the great battles we took part in and took Brook, we marched into that battle or went into that battle with a piper marching in front of us, playing the Campbells are coming. Uh, <laughs> not John Campbell, that would have scared the... <laughs> but seriously, we, we need to... Yes, we do need to take into account our history. We need to have clarity about it. And as for the Australian flag, and our flag, we got ours first, so they maybe could change theirs. <laughs> Pamela, would like to respond to that uh, one too? Sure, I, I agree with you. I think there is a growing love affair with history in New Zealand, and we certainly see it in, in the listener. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at, say, the Canadian flag, it, it doesn't represent their constitutional arrangements or their history or the relationship they're still in the Commonwealth. All it is is a 11 point. It looks more than a maple leaf, but it's a living point symbol that everybody immediately recognises and is a rallying point for the Canadian nationalism and pride. I'm, I'm really interested that we're having this debate and this discussion about what goes on in the flag. I'm wondering if you can suggest how we move on from the discussion to the design and actually how we're going to get acceptance because we can go round and round about what's going to be in it and who should be doing it and so on. 
There is a winnowing going on, you know, there, there, it is shaking down. I, I mean, I, I've been involved with it for so long and I've never seen it get quite as specific as it's becoming. And I just think that like anything else, as long as these discussions and the magazines and the reporting and everything else keep, and people keep pushing it and it just keeps rolling along, I think you'll be surprised how it steers towards some sort of tipping point where it will be, get narrower and narrower. That I, I really believe that, that, that there will be a, um, you know, it's, everyone's, it'll be a story of logic and common sense and common sense. I tell you a little story about that one that I'm uh, promoting. The Australians are also promoting a very, very similar design for their <laughs> And I tell you, if, if the Australians jump on it and change their flag to that with the Southern Cross, we'll all go, bugger. I guarantee it. Right. And we'll say, why didn't we do it? Michael. Right. 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 The thing about the Australians is that they didn't have Gordon Walters. <clears throat> and Gordon Walters is the man who gave us a visual language that is absolutely uh, nails the story of New Zealand identity, particularly as painting number one. What I've done with my flag is to uh, both, <clears throat> to answer your question, the, um, it has to be grounded in something that makes absolute sense to the inhabitants of the country it's representing. Uh, and it's with that confidence and clarity that it, it goes out into the world uh, and gets uh, accepted and interpreted. The thing about flags is that they, they work best when they're completely abstract and Gordon Walters was a Puritan abstract painter. He didn't have any narrative, any uh, meaning uh, applied to his work, but he was very happy if people looked at it and saw some metaphor there. Um, but what makes his works work well as metaphors is what makes them work well as abstract. I mean, he makes them work well in their own right. So um, my uh, flag does uh, embody the, the treaty, the coming together of two cultures, uh, and that uh, what they create together is stronger than what they are apart. But it also um, <clears throat> uh, is open to the interpretation of a number of cultures by having eight dots there. There's uh, a bit more lively dynamism going on. Um, Asian cultures could see it as an interpretation of yin and yang, uh, which is very fundamental to their understanding of the way the world works and, and to ours. Um, and so um, <clears throat> I think to answer Helen's question, uh, really easy. Everybody just needs to agree with me and we'll be done. <laughs> I was musing then about the heart tone. You know, well, let's not have too much narrative about a flag. I mean, after all, the um, opposing general doesn't say, tells his troops the narrative before he orders them to fight. He said, just shoot at that lot under that thing. And uh, that thing is actually what it will become. There will be, I guess, that's right, there will be a moment when we, we know it's right. But I was listening on a Kim Hill show this morning to a New Zealand scientist, who, Greg Brightman, who works in Australia, actually, um, and has worked all over the world, and he said, what is wrong with New Zealand science? It's usually a committee deciding, first of all, what we'll look for. And I fear very much that that kind of process, we're falling into that. You know, you know the, um, the um, evolution of man where you get up to homo sapiens and then they start going down again to chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, you know, next one down from homo sapiens is homo mutandus, committee man who carries a great <laughs> <laughs> And let us not fall into that trap. I mean, there will come a moment when something, and I'm not quite sure how we will get there, but I hope before we make that decision, we won't be looking at it as squares on a wall, we'll be looking at some beautifully sewn things like that object there, flapping in the wind. 
So we'll kind of know what's happening. I'm just going to Pamela first. Yeah, yeah, but Hamish, I've got bad news for you. It's already scheduled uh, in the Prime Minister's press releases that a committee of experts <laughs> will be formed. <laughs> and I think you'll probably be asked to chair it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So that's about as late as eating a dead seagull. <laughs> so, Pamela, do you think that the Prime Minister Pearson's approach would pretty much a committee come up with this idea, this is pretty much what's going to happen? Seems to me that's a little bit what Hamish is talking about there. Sure. I mean, right now, I think we should just do it. If not now, then when? You know, um, the country, there will always be more important things, um, you know, child poverty and other things, but, you know, we, we do discuss those things. Um, uh, I think things that have, uh, things have changed is the realisation that we don't have to have the whole republicanism debate, that's separate, um, and the realisation that a flag is just a flag, I mean, sadly it's not going to make us go any faster at the Commonwealth Games, it is just a, a flag, but I think the, the approach is right that there is a, um, a multi-party team in Parliament, and I think so for all the, all the parties, um, I think the only um, omission was John Banks. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> so, so to, to agree on the, um, the terms of the um, referendum and then um, the setting up of a, um, a steering committee to, um, to to look at how we actually to look at the designs and how we actually choose one. Um, but in the end, I think we have to just do it. Well, we've got three already. We're small enough, isolated enough, and inconsequential enough to uh, make it quite a hard job just to be recognised with one, uh, let alone multiple. So, uh, but uh, my uh, feeling about the Gordon Walters formal language is not to reduce it to a single motif, but uh, but to for people to play with it, do different things with it, like the Film Commission has done, and and others, and that we start um, <clears throat> using that unique uh, visual language to express ourselves, and colour can come into it uh, and where appropriate, uh, uh, so we don't have to just nail it all down to one rectangular form that gets stuck on things. It's a, it's a system of identity. But we do have, you know, we've got the all-black sport flag, which is, there's the third, and we've got uh, this one, and we've got the new one, <laughs> which we haven't got yet. You know, I mean, that's three. We, we do have three quite distinctive flair. I mean, that, that, funnily enough, when you put the fern on the on a rectangle, a bit of black thing, and put it on a stick and wave it at the, at the rugby, it makes perfect sense. It's definitely a flag, isn't it? Yeah. Or like a pennant or something, you know, yeah. pennants. But it, it, it the. But it's not going to transcend from that, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's, there's the brand, wave the brand at the All Blacks. So we, we've already got three quite distinct flags that we do use in tandem, or triple tandem, or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> so that, I think that's, that's always going to happen. But isn't yeah. that, um, Hamish, isn't that sort of a bit confusing? Don't we need a standard that sort of is the paramount? Standard, what is that stand by? Well, it's confusing, but we, it's also a fact we have more than three flags. Yeah. There are numerous flags that are official flags. Uh, the, the Governor General has a flag. Um, well, he does, but I have no idea. Maybe, maybe he waves at the football. But no, nonetheless, we do have a set of flags, and the countries always do. And I just go back to the point I made at the beginning that New Zealand has had, in its time since uh, 1762, has had. 1,500 flags fly officially in the New Zealand air. So in fact, I just want to make a point again to get on to the business of process, is that I hope we have a genuine visual discussion about flags. Now, um, what do you mean by well, visual discussion? Well, Michael yeah. is a very good publisher, and I think the first thing we need to do is to have some kind of idea about how flags here look and have looked. I mean, I'd, be, I'd settle for the exhibition of the 100 Tikuti flags, just to get an idea of how the visual, New Zealand visual imagination has been exercised on these symbols of identity. I mean, we have a grand history of flags, but like most things we have a grand history of, we're grand at ignoring it. And I think when we do have a history of flags, we do have a history of symbols, we're pretty good at symbols, but we just ignore them. We just say, oh, we're not very good at that. And I'm afraid it's because we do not 
have a discussion enough about the reality of ourselves and the reality of us in faves is a pretty great one. So get on that book, I'll write the introduction. <laughs> I'm going to talk about something quite different, which is the flag, of course. But coming from England in the war as a child, I, um, I just know the flag as a symbol of war. And also, as we've gone along, you know, talking about battles and warfare, it's coming on, you know, here we go with the flag, uh, once more into the breach, dear friends. So I have never been um, in favor of flags. But I've, I realize I've changed my attitude slightly when, number one, I saw the um, Japanese warships in Auckland recently. And I thought, what are they doing there? Who is it? And I, I do try to remember one flag from another. And I thought, it's Japan, and immediately it's Japan because of their flag. And it just, you know, I thought, oh, that's clever. And I realized who it was. And I done just recently done hip hop in Las Vegas. And there was a tremendous, the Olympic World Finals with 42 countries. So what is your question? My question is that one can change one's mind because of this communication we had with all these 42 countries, these young people, and we were an older group. And it was so good to see them with their flags. And I actually immediately recognized the New Zealand flag. And it gave me a wonderful feeling because I knew what it was. So the point I'm making, I suppose, I think it should be easily recognizable. <laughs> because it can change your whole concept of everything. Great. Well, it sounds like you could have been on a panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, symbols don't necessarily come loaded with meaning. They can build meaning around an abstract form. And in the article I wrote for the listener, Return of the Flutterboat, which I think was 2004, I noted that the swastika, the Third Reich Nazi flag, uh, is loaded with emotion now, but there's nothing inherently emotive about the form that was used as a peace symbol and uh, by the Hindu, by a number of different groups, the Boy Scouts, all sorts have used that symbol before. But uh, it then Hitler did the, arguably the best graphic design version of it. Uh, and, uh, and then it got associated with a whole lot of horrible things. And now we can't look at it without it being hugely emotive. But it's not the shape itself that's emotive, it's what it's become associated with. And um, <clears throat> so whatever we do, however simple and abstract it would be, the old French tree colour is just three colours, but it's very loaded with emotion for the French. Dick, just coming back to that question about process again, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, Hamish made a very good point about really having a look at and absorbing what we do have there as a pre-consideration to where we're going. What else do you see as important in process? Uh, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I, in terms of a process of coming up with a flag. Oh, well, obviously, there's always going to be an element of salesmanship in this. I mean, who, whoever, whatever we do, zero in on, the one, you know, there's, people are going to have to be talked into it, aren't they? Talked into it. And how that talking is put across, well, it'll be through the media, it'll be through... Why, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, there, 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 there's definitely going to be an element of snake oil, actually, to be honest. <laughs> you know, we're going to... And if you... And then, of course, there is a story behind these things that Hamish has said. And the story, you know, the, the, it's, the best story will win at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I said that. <laughs> Whatever people might think about it in the propaganda, it is going to be part of the process, whichever way we look at it. And Hamish is great, he's got a great knack for digging back, and he'll be, he'll be probably talking us into this one eventually. <laughs> <laughs> for artists to design a flag with its meaning and then have a refer referendum which is binding. <laughs> It's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> well, I think it is a good idea to get everybody designing flags, and, and but at the end of the day, oh God! <laughs> 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 All the <this> seven. <laughs>
past our New Zealand tendency to, um, to be modest and, yeah. um, and um, a bit ambivalent and, and not to take bold action. I think this calls for bold action. Mm. It calls for us to see, to visualise what it would be like on some you know, distant lawn, maybe not too distant, uh, and seeing a new national flag that unites us, that represents all the bonds that unite us um, and has been talked through and there is a broad consensus. To, to see that unfurled and flying, as you say, to see a flag flying has a physiological effect. I mean, it's almost like a placebo, placebo effect. And, mm. you know, um, I don't think we have to fear that we'll this, you know, spurs up some nationalism that will invade Australia or anything. But I do think it will, it will mean that um, um, occasions of, of national significance we want to celebrate. I mean, other countries have fireworks, festivities, and flags on their national days. You see it in America, you see it in Australia even. And I think it would be a fantastic thing for New Zealand. I mean, here on important days, we have fireworks, we blow up fans with them. <laughs> no, can I just make one point, though, but mention the, the, uh, the swastika. Um, let's just get something right. Having a great image will not make us better people. But in fact, it might make us more aware of we are together, and instead of being, as the wonderful uh, um, oh, Tim Finn song, Together Alone. In fact, you know, a flag. If you think don't, if you don't think flags are emotional things, I wish I. One thing I would like to have seen was the Tuhoi flag being handed back last week. Yeah. And that was an emotional moment about a flag. Yeah. And I guess that's really what flags are. At the beginning of the day, uh, the flag. <laughs> The flag will be raised at dawn at Waitangi and we'll all uh, have a look at, uh, reflect ourselves back to ourselves. Um, yep. Have you been that you were selected to be on this committee working in Parliament to finally uh, come up with this design? For each of you personally, what would be the significant contribution that you would be looking to bring to that? that you feel would be really vital in terms of a flag design representing all the things we've talked about today? My understanding is that the committee is not a design committee, it's a client committee. It's a representative of stakeholders, no doubt. Uh, across the spectrum there'll be somebody from the RSA and somebody from uh, Tangata Whenua, maybe a number of uh, iwi, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll be operating more as the client. I don't want to be on that committee. I want to be uh, one of the designers submitting to that committee. And in the event that you were, Michael, what would be the key thing you would want to bring to that? I would want to bring something that, represent, that represents our comparatively recent history as uh, unique and uh, grounded in biculturalism and the treaty, but uh, growing beyond that and, um, and having the courage to be different and fresh and um, full of vitality and potential. Thank you. Hamish. Simple thing, I would be looking for clarity. Mm. Mm. Um, I think I've just got two words, one more word than you. It's a, a positive, energising flag. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I won't be, I'm not going to die in a ditch over there, one of mine, obviously, but I, you know, I'll be talking to Hamish person, get him a, doing my homework, getting my story right. Say that, but if I have to pitch this thing, but I do, and I think, and I totally agree with you. That's the point I want to make. At the end, it's someone's going to have to say, "This is it." You know, New Zealand, we go on forever being nice and kind and fair and democratic, and oh my God, you know. But I think we're just going to have to get a little bit, bit stroppy at some point and say, "Hey guys, this is the flag." It's you know, so. yeah. Great. And thank you for your support of this event this afternoon and continue to enjoy the exhibition. Thank you.